Hello, welcome to another Rahalastapa this week with the amazing Sindhu V. One of my absolute favourite stand-ups, she's brilliant. Um, hope you're enjoying these remote records. We are carrying on and recording them most Wednesdays at 8pm. I've had a couple of weeks off. Um, coming up, uh, Michael, Ian Black and Stevie Martin. Not that one. Uh, and we're very close to our 300th official episode as well, which we're doing something special for. Um, what else have I got to tell you, my fan friends? We've got a Kickstarter going for um, the Snooker podcast. It's a beautiful Punani sticker album. A chance to collect all the stickers to swap. Um, and there's also lovely T-shirts and membership badges and all sorts of stuff. There's a couple of weeks to go. Just under now, and we're about halfway to the total. Started very strong, gone very quiet. It usually has a upswing at the end, but all the profits will go to helping live comedy. So it's worth getting on board if you fancy it. Also, check out twitch.tv slash RK Herring. I do Ali and Herring's Twitch of Fun on Thursday nights. I do snooker on Monday nights usually and uh, there may be some other bits and pieces coming up and if you're with Amazon Prime you can link your Twitch and well Amazon Gaming I think it's called now and Prime accounts and give us free money at no cost to yourself. So have a look into that if you fancy that and do remember to come back and resubscribe if you've done it before. That's Pimpsy. You just click subscribe, click the right button and you're off. Um, anyway... Lots of exciting stuff coming up very soon. My new book, Problem With Men, is also out soon. You can pre-order that at all your usual places. There's going to be a great audio book. We've got Deborah Francis White doing an exclusive podcast about the subject with me as well on that audio book. We're going to make it super good value for money, but you can buy the book, the ebook, or the audio book, or whatever you want. My fine friends, it's up to you. Now let's sit back, relax, and enjoy Raha Lastapa with Sintu V. Please welcome a man who's travelling in time and space. It's Richard Herring. Hello. Hello, my fine friends. Look at me. Can you believe it? Welcome to Richard Herring's lovely, shiny TARDIS podcast. Uh, I, was, I was hanging around. I was fighting the Sea Devils uh, this week. Um, they're not the best known of the Doctor Who monsters, but uh, that's what they look like there. H how cool is this? How cool is this? Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, they made a big impression on me, the sea monsters, for some reason, when I was four. Uh, especially the bit where Joe, the companion, was climbing through a lighthouse window and you saw a bum. That, I think that's why the sea devils uh, spoke to the four-year-old. Anyway, the sea devils call it Rahalastapa, so there you go. And there is, look, it says Rahalastapa on that. How could, do you like, what do you think about my TARDIS? That's right. That's what we've been spending your money on, a TARDIS. It's a real one. Um, so anyway, welcome. Uh, it's great to be back. It's not as hot this week. People were worried I was going to melt, but I am absolutely fine. Uh, and uh, I want to tell you a couple of jokes my daughter's been doing. Um, let's see if I can find them. Uh, oh, hold on, I'm going to have to search for that one again because it's gone away. Um, uh, she's come up with a joke. This is a, this is a this is a joke she came up with recently. We were on holiday, and uh, she passed a sign that said. Uh, Private keep out. It was just the end of a drive to stop uh, tourists parking there. And um, my daughter said, "What are you doing that's so private? Pooping," which I quite liked. Uh, and um, she wrote a joke yesterday uh, that goes like this. She's very proud of this one at bedtime. Knock knock. Who's there? Gingerbread man. Gingerbread man. Who? He poos on the windowsill and says, "Ooh, what's that sweet smell?" It's better than my stuff, I have to say. So uh, that's that's how that's going down. Uh, I'm a bit worried about my material because uh, it's my first stand-up gig, live stand-up gig in a theatre on Sunday for like met, probably a year, over a year actually because I haven't been doing many actual gigs but certainly since the last Rahela Uh I can show you a picture of it there. Uh, look, that's it's uh, the Clapham Grand. Is that me? That looks, like a sea, that looks like a sea devil. Look at that. That's the same as a sea. Doesn't I don't look like that. Who's that? Strange, sud-faced man um 
ridiculous. Uh, but I've made a decision over lockdown, which I think I talked about, uh, that I am not going to do any pre-virus material on stage again, unless I end up doing an old show at some point in the future. So all previous material will be wiped out, and I'm going to do a brand new set on Sunday, which I have to tell you, I have not started writing yet. Uh, so it's great for me. It's a wonderful, clean sweep for me. But if anyone is at that gig, 10 minutes can be a very long time. It's going to be a very challenging. <laughs> I might bring Ali along. He's just here. Uh, hey, why not come along and see me tomorrow night in Lee and Ali and Herring's Twitchathon? Uh, that's uh, the other show I do. Um, and I should mention, just for the people watching this live, uh, we are doing a Kickstarter at the moment. Uh, for stone clearing, you can pay and get a witch's finger or a witch's dip from my actual field. That's the box that will come in. There's all sorts of wonderful stuff. If you go to rehearsedpercouk slash Kickstarter, you can make a donation. If you've enjoyed all this free stuff over the summer and the hours and hours of stuff I've put out, um, even if you just want to put in a few quid, it would be really helpful. We're struggling a little bit. We've got uh, nine more days to hit, to hit the target, and uh, we're about... Um, 35% of the way there. So it's a, it's exciting times. I don't think we're going to make it, but you can prove me wrong if you like. And there will be a snooker one coming up soon as well, if you if you prefer the snooker. Uh, and do remember to resubscribe on Twitch. If you're on Amazon Prime, you can subscribe on Twitch and do it for free. Numbers have dropped down quite a lot. So a lot of you, I hope the people who aren't doing it anymore are doing it with someone else and giving their money to someone else. It's £5 a month free to give to anyone on Twitch that you want to do. It would be lovely if you did it. Oh, and it was Andrew Collins' day, of course, wasn't it? The A-level results came out, and I, I felt very bad for Andrew Collins because he is obsessed with the picture the next day when all the girls are jumping up in the air on the front page of the newspaper. That didn't happen this year because it was sad. the A-levels were sad. So there was lots of pictures of sad students crying and stuff. And I thought, how is Andrew Collins going to get off the one day of the year that he enjoys? But then the results were changed, and they sort of nearly they showed girls looking happy. They weren't really jumping, though, and that's what he likes, so... We'll see. Anyway, right, let's crack on with our fantastic guest tonight. Uh, she's probably best known for playing the chemist wife in Sick of It. That's why we're all here tonight, to see the chemist wife from Sick of It. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome the amazing Sindhu V. There she is. She's not in a TARDIS. No, I'm not in a How TARDIS. Are you doing, Sindhu? I'm doing very well. I have been waiting for you to ask me to be on your podcast, so this is a real moment for me. I asked you, and you said you'd come on, and then you pulled out. You were meant to be on on the same one as Richard E. Grant, who then – it was a cursed night that night because he didn't let us put the, his podcast out either. So oh, yeah. it's good to have you here. It's good to have you now. Delighted uh, and, to be uh, here. I, you know, I, we were just talking about it before we uh, we w went on air, but uh, I saw you very in a very early gig of yours where we did a charity gig together and was incredibly impressed. I thought you'd been going for ages. You were very assured, and I thought, you know, deaf. You see, I mean, you, you often don't remember uh, when you've, you know, five or six years later, you don't remember having seen people. But I completely remember meeting you. I completely remember being very impressed by that set. And I can't believe that you weren't really even doing stand-up, like, full-time at that point, were you? I think I just started making it full-time, but it wasn't anything close to what it became by 2017, 18. No, yeah. but it was just a – but I remember meeting you because I um, – uh, I had done a course, uh, Logan Murray's course, uh, on, you know, like how to hold a microphone and stuff. I didn't know anything. And since I had never seen live stand-up before I started doing it, I had a lot of catching up to do. And I remember there were various people in the room in our class, and they would all talk about different comedians you had to know. And, you, of course, one of the names on my list in my notebook is Richard Herring. Of course. And so, I, and so that gig that you remember, which I remember very well, um, as I mentioned to you earlier, was a gig where I thought uh, it wasn't it wasn't like my usual gigs where it's like, am I a comic? It's like, if I'm doing this gig, I'm a comic. I'm on yeah. with Richard Herring and a bunch of other people. I think Mae Martin was on that night, wasn't she? I think so. Was Frankie, was it, Fra I've, got, I've got a few mixed up. Was Frankie yeah. Boyle on that night? No. I don't know if it was. No, it was no, different. No, no, I think no. it was the same venue. Yeah, yeah, it was the same, it was same venue. So, no, it was a really, it was, it was a turning point for me, I think, to, no, to be on the gig for it to have gone well and for you to have repeated one of my jokes back to me when I came backstage and I thought, right, I'm, n you know, n not imposter syndrome. Yeah. Well, what I was impressed with then and still am, and I know you're doing, uh, still doing material about this, was you were doing material about being a parent 
which a lot of comedians are worried about doing, and uh, and some comedians is it's easy to do slightly hack material about, it, and some audience. I think it's more the hack, the more hack response. I think is audiences don't like people talking about the people who don't have kids don't like comedians talking about their kids, and they think it's cliche. Whereas I think that reaction's more cliche. And you know, I like it when I go to see comedians who don't share my life experience, but some people don't. But I think it was it was it was very as as you've then gone on to show with what you've done since but it was very impressive material that was honest about being a parent and uh and certainly not not oh look at my kids aren't they wonderful which is what i think people are worried that comedians will do yeah about, you know you've, you've always done stuff uh that uh i mean it, it's wonderful because you're quite a, a, a sort of an waspish isn't the right word but you're quite a cynical and uh almost hard-hearted about what you're saying but they're so charming that it comes across uh, <laughs> equally I think but it's but it's that's what's nice yeah. about that, that you really had that persona off so early you know you had yeah. this assurance on stage but yeah. what's interesting about it, well, let's talk about it straight well, because what's interesting about it is you came to stand-up comedy not only quite late as uh, you were in your 40s when you started yeah. but also you weren't really that interested in comedy well, before I, so you didn't know much about stand up before well i think this is the thing is i had no academic interest in comedy um i don't come from a country or a culture where we had ac- i didn't have access to stand up i'd seen a, a dvd of eddie murphy but i always was the person that would laugh about the worst things not laugh at them but laugh through them sure. and so i had a lot of i had a lot of organic interest in funniness over drama or or you know romance um i was always the girl where you'd be in a really delicate moment with a boy and they'd say could you stop laughing or could you stop telling a joke and you'd be like why not <laughs> you know that kind of thing um so yeah no but i had absolutely no background in stand up and i for a long time i used to feel that i had no right to be in a room because i just didn't know so many facts you yeah. know i i remember one of the times an italian friend of mine she said something about eddie izard and i was like who is that and she said to me sindu sindu she couldn't take it seriously she was like you cannot do comedy scene and i was like well, who and then i went and googled and i mean and i have no problem saying that because i think i i i was so riveted by wanting to be back on stage yeah that i educated it was like a turbo education i gave myself i remember standing at the school gates but across the street from the other mothers so they wouldn't talk to me cuz i'd be watching clips of billy connolly on my phone I literally for those 3 years I breathed and lived because I had so much catching up to do and I think because I came at it with such um fresh eyes yeah definitely I never every gig at that time to me was like jumping into the abyss sure but I think that's it coming at it from a complete you know a lot of what happens a lot and happened to me straight out of university decided to want to be a comedian had no life experience of anything else <clears throat> and well versed in how comedy works so you end up churning out something that's to begin with similar to other people or similar to the people you've watched. So I think you've to start a having had a lot, ha- having lived a life, having had jobs and having had a family, you had something to talk about. Which as me, uh, that's why when I started at twenty two, coming and doing live comedy in London, I thought, you know, what the hell am I meant to talk about? What what am I going to joke about? Who am I? I didn't know any of those things for another ten or fifteen years, um, and so to, you know, I think just that very fact that you are coming at it from just like someone stepping from outside and going hey I'll give this a go 100% and not knowing what it is even I mean I know I heard you talking about how you didn't know what you know any of the terminology and so you didn't know what a no, set I, was no I said to Lynn Parker set of what at the funny women thing and everyone laughed like it was a joke but I'm old enough to know that I was like oh I better just roll with this I one of the things I don't I I I, I practice I really practice on um uh, I, I I practice uh, exterminating guilt and regret from my life. I fail every day, but I try, all right? <laughs> One of the things I regret is I didn't come to comedy sooner because I would right. have had more time. Sure. I have this sense that I don't have as much time as people who started even in their 30s, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I have to talk myself off the ledge about that all the time. I often go to my husband and he talks me off the ledge because I think he just thinks I cannot freaking have this conversation again with her. Um, so, I, yeah. But I think, I say, I think 
that you're wrong. I think you know. I completely get it. I I had a big and I gave up doing stand up between in between that twenty two and thirty five, and I kind of regret it. But I also don't regret it because I think I went and did other stuff and I kind of got an experience of who I was. And I genuinely think what makes you extraordinary, you know, it, if you'd come in and it had taken you ten years to work out what you wanted to do. Yeah, that would be bad because you know then there's limited time left. Yeah, but but hit the ground running and we're great straight yeah. away. So you know, but I often think of the lifestyle I could have had if I'd been in my twenties. You know, oh my god, all the partying with other comics, which I haven't really done because it's just so outside the realm of what's possible for me. And also, I think what I'm interested in now, I often think, oh my god, I, I would have probably been a train wreck. I would never have made it because I would have just gotten into the party lifestyle and then evaporated into the into the ether. Yeah, no one invited me to those parties, so that's why I was all right. I think you brought what, you know, obviously having had quite, you had a high-powered job, you're an investment banker, right? So you had a, a high-powered job and a well-paid job, and you've seen to have brought, I, I think your family is very interesting, your parents are very interesting in the way that they've pushed you and not cosseted you <laughs> and been quite rude to you, I think, in a lot of the stories I've heard, if those stories are true. Uh, but you know, you've you've like you were talking about just writing, making notes. You talk about having notes about all your gigs, yeah. and you've you've approached it as you know as a job, which is I think what again a lot of comedians don't do. And 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 you've fast tracked because you've learned so much so quickly, yeah. but also you're learning all the time. And ha- t- I heard you talking to Stuart. I know you're doing a podcast with him now, Stuart Goldsmith, and talking about you know working out exactly what you wanted to do and 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 wanting to get better and wanting to be seen as one of the best comedians. And I think that's, you know, that's interesting. I think, again, a younger person would be out partying, whereas an older person's going, okay, look, I'm, I need to get on with this. I've got a family. I can't mess around. Well, I've that's it. This, that's know. it. I just, I was, con- I was always aware that I couldn't wake up in the middle of the afternoon, you know, and I couldn't, I, I had to pack a lot in. I didn't really, comedy is the only space, um, that I've involved myself in that I haven't had a burning desire for a particular outcome. And part of that is because I thought I can't do that again because comedy was in a lot of ways for me, it was like coming home. And I sensed that, but I couldn't quite grasp it the way I do now. And I didn't want to ruin it. And I think sometimes if you're very ambitious and if you can be quite a perfectionist, which are qualities that my parents really you know, ingrained in us, um, you can ruin things for you for yourself, and I didn't want to do that. I also had no, <laughs> I genuinely had no idea what a mark would be. Like, what would I want to do next? You know, mm-hmm. I left Logan Murray's course thinking I'd like to get a ten-minute paid spot. That was it. If I could do that, then I had cracked comedy. Hey, I didn't know about other things, and I think I actively stayed away from it as well because, partly because I didn't have a peer group. All my friends were civilians. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, I also kept it secret for a very long time because, I mean, I just thought this is something I'm doing. And I I think when you're a parent, you a, a parent and a spouse and a daughter, and you come from a, maybe maybe it's for everyone, but you know, you, you, you come from a very community-oriented culture like I do, very little is left for yourself. Mm-hmm. All your roles, they take something from you. But I had experienced a great deal of being for myself in the years that I had left India and I was studying abroad. I was, I was, I was a, I was a single unit Mm -hmm. and I remember how, how much freedom I had and I wanted, and in comedy, I experienced that freedom on stage, whether it was for five minutes or seven minutes. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't want to give it up. I don't even know if this, this is making sense, but. No, it is. But I I mean, I think, you know, that's, that's why. You're so unlike most comedians, which makes you absolutely fascinating to me. Um, but also, I mean, you're so, you're very driven. I mean, I, you, you, I've heard you talk about your mum taking you out of plays and stuff because you, you have to do well in your exams. And you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you were talking about before about your dad saying you couldn't. You got a job as a model, and your dad said you weren't allowed to be a model. And even For when you YSL. were an actor, your your, your family was. Yeah, I mean, it's not like just a model. It was like YSL saying, "Can we sign you for Paris?" And he was like, "Absolutely not. You've got to study." Right. So, you know, so you even as a young adult, your parents were dictating what you could and couldn't do. So you had this strict, fairly strict upbringing, obviously a different culture. You've lived all over the world. First of all, you've been to four universities. I don't know if you've got four degrees, but you've got four. Yeah, I do have four degrees. degrees. I do have four four degrees. degrees. 
so you you're absolutely driven and obviously your your parents with a bit of tough love but uh, Sort of not not unusual direction. for India. Yeah. Not unusual no. for India. In fact, it was my parents' liberalism which was more unusual. Sure. The fact that they, my father absolutely never put pressure on me to marry. He never put pressure on me to become a doctor or a mathematician. Or, and I was studying philosophy, which was unheard of. I remember my aunt saying, oh, psychology? It's like, no, philosophy. She was like, physiotherapy? Like, she couldn't even understand what philosophy was. My father was very liberal. My mother was... She was a very complicated character, but ultimately ex- very wedded to the idea of living life to the fullest, but within the confines of things that didn't look bad in the Indian context. Like you, sh- like you couldn't be unemployed or a spinster because that will be so much shame that I will wish I'm dead or I had no uterus to give you the birth. It's like, well, that's a lot of information when you're young. I, one of the first words I learned in English was uterus. Because my mother was constantly cursing her uterus for having spewed me out because I didn't get, you know, I didn't do this or didn't do that properly. But anyway, so I think it was actually their liberalism that I don't think they realized. I don't think they realized the effect it had on me. Uh, that it, there was always this thing in me that I, uh, that somewhere inside you could be all the things you wanted while also being quite mainstream, having the proper job, marrying the proper person, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But um, comedy was such a place of play for me. And I think, you know, I had three children and all of that's great, but I hankered after this moment, this sense of freedom. And also the thing is, no one I knew went to comedy clubs where I was doing open mics. I could get up and say anything. (laughs) And I realized that I had a lot to say, a lot to say. And I just, I just really, you know, kicked off. And it was, I, I am forever grateful to comedy for giving me, it was just so much excess stuff. I was like, ah, you know, and then, um, and then calm down after a while. Started actually saying jokes as opposed to just blabbing at the audience. <laughs> but so it, it, did it partly come out? You had this high power job and you'd had kids and you had, did you, you had a sort of a bit of a breakdown mm. at that stage? Was it just the, was it the pressure between family and work or was it? No, I think what it was was, um, I think I, I wonder if I said this on Stu's podcast. I really didn't recognize how maternal I was. And by maternal, I mean all, I didn't realize how much I cared about being around the children, around my child versus achieving some big goal. I just thought the big goals were the thing. You had a kid, you got a nanny, you went and you, you know, I just, it never occurred to me. And I think I I I refuse to accept that fundamentally I I wanted to be at home with my child but that meant walking away from an entire identity that I'd built over many many years Sindhu you know achieving and going to Oxford and then she becomes a banker and how could she not be an MD and how could she not run her desk I think there was a massive break within me uh because I didn't want to give that up and I think it's really about giving up your identity. I mean, my identity was not to be a housewife. That was just, th- th- also for my mother, you know, she was upset. She said to me, I, you, you've studied so much, you've done so well, just to be housewife. Because in India, feminism at that time was about women working and not staying home with their kids. Whereas in the West, they'd gone a bit further. Yeah. And it was like, you know, it, it, there was having a child and raising your child is such a high goal over here you know people are like oh the biggest job in the world is to be a mom in india there's a billion of us no one thinks it's a big job they're like huh, yet another child you know so it was all this stuff and um i think i think the idea of just being a mother uh really it, it wreaked havoc within me about what i what you know what was i going to achieve and so i think that was it i think that was why i had a real moment like i went quite bananas uh, but then, you know, when you have children and of course some people can't help it, but I, I had to pick myself up, pick myself up off the ground relatively quickly. Um, but it took me a long time to unpick that. I, I think not achieving marks I'd set for myself was a matter of great shame to me and shame and guilt, you know, these things, they exist in the very dark recesses of our sense of self. 
and when they come into the light, sometimes you're 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 not strong enough to face them. Is, does that even make sense? I think it does. It's just, you know, it's sort of fascinating. So, that was the was comedy the way out of that? Was that no, was, no, no, no. Com- that was that just came afterwards. I was thirteen years. I was at home with yeah. the kids, and right, I, yeah, you know, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I um, you know, and then I was, and then I was just a really good stay at home mom. I, I mean, I wasn't that good because I didn't make like the cake for the fairs, and I thought that stuff was ludicrous, ludicrous. This business of homemade cakes. I wanted. I was like, are you joking? Are you? Tesco has perfectly good cake. I don't even know why I'm here baking these cakes. But I did become like, you know, I was co-head of my kids' school association, where I basically told jokes all day. I don't even know. My, the, I, was co, I was co-head, but the woman I was head with, she was the head. And I was basically like the PR person. I just told jokes the whole time so we could get things through that the other mothers didn't really want. I just kind of lulled them into a sense of happiness by telling them jokes while Zena got everything else through, <laughs> like Christmas lights. How much is the budget for Christmas lights? I remember that. No, no, comedy, comedy was absolutely not um, anything. It didn't rescue me at the time that this stuff was very, you know, uh, acute. But I think I. <laughs> I, I, to be honest, and this is going to sound ludicrous, I haven't worked it out. I haven't worked it out. I, I, I don't know where comedy came from. I mean, I know the, the, the steps, but the way it landed, it was like I was just overjoyed that it had found me. Yeah. And I had absolutely no big goals. I just wanted to go out and gig. That's literally all I wanted, and that's still all I really want. You know, yeah. uh, a friend of mine, she said to me last year, she said, you know what makes me crazy? And she was a banker with me. She said, if this thing went back to zero and you went out to gig for free, you'd still do it. I said, I would. And I'm very lucky that I can say that. You know what I mean? Yeah. But well, I think most, com- most comedians would, and certainly now most comedians would yeah. gig for free if they could get back and do gigs. Um, but, you know, that it is, it's, it's, it's just fascinates me that you could, that, that could have happened. I mean, you know, you, it's, it's just, your your brain is a very interesting thing, and the way the way that you've come to these decisions and and all the things you've done in your life. I mean, you speak a lot of like, I've seen you doing bilingual stand up shows. But I am bilingual, you, of course. But you are you more than you speak Danish as well. So I understand Danish. I don't. I don't. I don't speak Danish as well as I would like to. I did do a course at some point when it was in the middle of the be at home mom thing. Um, but then I was like, oh, you know, do I really need to know that much? Like, every, you know, whatever. Or I got bored. Or I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't stick with it. But I can understand enough. Yeah. Because um, your husband's Danish. So mm-hmm. do, you, do your kids speak Danish? No, speak he Danish never talked right? to them in Danish. So I don't know. Oh, okay. You know, they, they don't speak Danish. But um, I think I think the important thing for me with comedy was um, I don't think at my age with three kids, I even understood how much more there was for me to experience. Mm-hmm. And comedy was like, no, you're not done yet. In fact, you're not done at all. Because if you ask me now, I would give up all the banking and everything and go straight back and have gone to, here's the thing. I could have gone to Oxford, which was a huge thing for me because it was a big deal. I mean, it's a great university and I got a scholarship and, you know, and all that. And I would have somehow met someone who did stand up and just stepped off the ledge. And that would have been it. And I'd have been totally happy. My parents probably would have not been happy, but I would but have. You didn't do any comedy at university. I, you know, I, I, we met Stuart at Oxford and we, I we would do sketches. I didn't know it was a thing. Comedy scene there. I didn't know. And you were thing. only there a few years after us. So we, I left in 89 and you went uh, in, in 91. 91. Yeah. But so, I think yeah. the thing is this, what happened was this, is that I came from a country where we'd never seen stand up. I was on a scholarship and I don't know if you remember the kids that came on scholarship. Of course, the Rhodes Scholars, you know, they had a lot of money, but we had a limited amount of money. And immediately that I started doing philosophy, I thought, oh God, I've got to do more of this. So my plan was how will I fund it? And so I began applying to American schools. It was all about staying afloat. Mm -hmm. And also I'd never studied philosophy, but I fell in love with it and I didn't want to do the economics. I was doing PPE. I didn't want to do the economics. And my father was like, you have to do economics. And then he didn't talk to me for a while because I wanted. So I did more courses in philosophy. Um, and it, I played basketball for the university. I rode for my college. It was a time of my brain exploded. I, I, I can't describe it any other way. And I was supposed to go home and get married. 
but I thought, I don't want to get married right now. I've got, I mean, first of all, I've got just, I'd like to sleep with some more people than just the guy I marry. So that's got, that was part of the, it was a huge part of my plan. In fact, my friends make fun of me now. They say, you used to always walk up to us and say, hi, my name is Sindhu. Do you have a boyfriend? And how did you get a boyfriend? They were like, what are you talking about? Oh, mortifying. But um, I had a lot I had to pack in into the two years that I was away from home. Um, and so I didn't, I mean, the comedy, drama, all that stuff was just, also, I, it had been, it had been drummed into me that that's not what you did if you were serious, if you were a serious student. And so I just didn't even look, sports was fine. So I played basketball for Oxford because I, 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 mean, I loved sport, you know, and I, I played for them and I rode for my college, which was the worst rowing team because we were all not from the UK except our Cox. And she was always like, why do you guys not? We didn't know what, why just was, we're all paddling like lunatics and just into the side of the, the Sharwell and just stay there. Our boat would just be perpendicular to the, to the bank and she'd be almost in tears every time. Um, but yeah, so I think, I think for me, there was no scope. That, there was not an inch of surplus that I could have devoted to something so outside my conscience mm -hmm. as uh, comedy. No, it's 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 fascinating stuff. Um, let's talk about your, your your stage name is Sindhu V. Sindhu V. Yeah, your real name. Go ahead, say it. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I've got it written down. I'm sure I've I've practiced, but I'm still going to get on. Sindhu is still your real name. Sindhu is my real name. Uh, Venkatanarayanan. It's a sixteen letter word. It's a good. That's a great. Is that's that okay? yeah. It's Venkatanarayanan, but that's great. And I just I I remember very clearly. In Logan Murray's class, talking to Sam Deards and Bisha Ali and saying, "What well, I can't call myself Sindhu Venkat Narayanan. So they were like, mm, no. And then my very, very close friend from high school, who's still a very dear friend of mine, she used to call me Sindhu V. Just, it was like a teenage girl thing. She would say Sindhu V and she would roll her eyes. So I thought, oh, Sindhu V. So I got on and then I was not on Facebook. And they were like, well, you need to be on Facebook because that's how you find out about gigs. So I was like, oh, okay. And so Facebook wouldn't let me use an initial. Okay. So I was like, V, okay, V-E-E. -E. That's it. Yeah. And the V. I mean, it is, you know, it's difficult to put that up on, on a, a, in a bill. That would, it, you'd be in very small letters if you'd gone for a 16 letter. No, plus who would so. ever call me on stage? I wouldn't get even an open mic spot. No matter going, please welcome to Sindhu Venkat Narayan. Even Indians can't say it. Yeah. No, 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 no need. I fancy, I, w I wish I'd done it. I'd Richard H, but it's not H is almost as long as my actual name. Yeah, and also H. What would that be? E H, and then it'd be like yeah. Richard. Eh? Well, there's, a, there's also H from Steps, but I realise he calls himself H, not H. He should be called H. He Plus, calls also, H. if you're living in England or the UK and your name is Richard Herring, why are you trying to check? Like, what's get it shorter? Just shorten it because the shorter Richard Rich Herring. Richard Herring is quite a long name, so like Richard that's Herring. about it. I should be rich. Rich H. Rich H. That's what I'm Rich H or Herr Richard. <laughs> it's a bit Herr German, Richard. but anyway. Eddie, Eddie E. Eddie E. <laughs> Eddie E. Peter K. He was probably, Peter, had, he probably had a 16 letter name. Yeah, he's probably Peter Kattamuttaparthi, and we don't even know it. We just think he's Peter K. Yeah. I think it's a good I think it's a good thing to do. I think it's good to try and but it is a really if it's Sindhu V is a very good showbiz name. Yeah. And yeah, the full thing is probably it's a, it's an it's long even for an Indian name, right? It's oh, not that well. Huge. It's it's long for a North Indian name. It's okay. it's sort of a new. It's not even that unusual, but it's quite unusual for a South Indian name. But South Indian names, I mean, my one uncle is Bala Subramaniam. My uncle, my other uncle is Vishwanathan. You know, so it, it's fine in in South India. It's fine. Venkat Narayanan is uh, not unusual for its length. It's unusual as a name, but it you know. It's, it's, it, I've lived in the Philippines as a child, man. I had to deal with Venkat Narayan my whole life. I was like, oh boy. But uh, it's very much part of my identity to have a name that stops people in their tracks. Sure. Did your family was that was that an issue for them changing the name, or do they do they not mind about? It? Is it because it's because I call myself Sindhu V? Yeah. No, 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 no. My parents only questioned things I did up until I had children. Okay. They were like, "You got married. You got a decent. You got a decent job. You got married. You've got kids. We really couldn't care less at this point." Plus, also, I think they. They, I think my my mother understood what comedy meant to me. She didn't necessarily get into whether I should be a success at it. My father thought it was some kind of indulgence hobby thing. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which I don't think he's really changed his mind much since then. <laughs> but my mother understood what it meant to me. And I started having these dreams after, like in 2017, 20, yeah, 2018, I took my debut hour. So 2017, after I did my 40 minutes in Edinburgh, I started having these dreams and I'm dressed in my, in a nightdress and I'm telling these jokes. And I used to, I, because I spoke to my mother very often, I would call, I called her and said, I'm having these dreams. And she said, it's not a dream. It's the truth. And I said, what do you mean? And she recounted to me that as a very young child, I would gate crash their dinner parties in my night suit and try and basically corral adults into a corner and start telling them jokes. But it was difficult because I had a very severe stammer. So it was painful for everybody except me. <laughs> a four-year-old with a terrible stammer and a bad joke. And my mother said, you know, she said, we used to tell you, we'll punish you, we'll do this. You were, you were unstoppable. And she said to me in 2018, she said, what I understand now is that there's some things you can't keep down. You always wanted to tell people jokes and now you're doing it and I'm very happy for you. And she said to me once, because I think you are in self-actualizing. And I was like, that's deep, man. That's deep. But and and but she was a therapist, so she, you know, she every once in a while came up with a term that I didn't disagree with. Because uh, she was also a therapist with a real twist of like, she's completely nuts. I, I I used to say to her, if you did therapy in the West, you'd be in jail. And she said, I know. Because she would constantly, like I would come back on holiday and she would say, you know that Mrs. Vadva, her daughter-in-law, she's a drug addict. And I'm like, why are you, te- where is the confidentiality? She would say, yeah, but you are not going to tell anybody. And I'm like, oh my God. I used to tell her, you'll be in jail. And she used to say, but that's why I'm not practicing in Western world. Anyway, uh, but she was a very, very good therapist. She actually helped a lot of people. So, yeah, so self-actualizing, you know. I yeah, mean, I don't want to... Wanna... I, I think it's interesting that, you know, I think I was the same. Maybe my daughter's the same. My daughter's very fascinated with jokes already, even though she doesn't fully understand them. But I was absolutely obsessed with, with yeah. comedy from the age of three or four. Anyone who made me laugh, any joke, even if I didn't understand it, I was dissecting it, remembering it, and then understanding it five years later. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, so yeah, it's obviously something in there that makes you want to perform. Yeah, and one of the worst it. things I I remember as a child was if we were in a group of kids and someone said something and then I didn't get it and someone said you didn't get the joke, it was devastating for me. <laughs> if they could have insulted me in any other way and I wouldn't have felt it wasn't even an insult; they were just informing me that I had not understood the joke. But the yeah. kind of otherness I felt, and I think that might have also been because I think at a very young age, I thought I should be in charge of the jokes here. I think I had that feeling. But when you're a kid with a stammer, yeah. no kid is giving you any leeway. They just don't want to know. No. You know, and I and think that was- How long did it take you to, to, to get over the stammer? I got it when I was about five or six, um, because we left India and we left my ayah behind, which they didn't tell her or me that they were going to do that. I developed the stammer very quickly within a week and somehow no one decided to do anything about it. But anyway, and then I started to work on it myself when I was, when we moved back to India. So I was about 11 and then by 13, it was almost, it was quite manageable. And then after that, it was only, there was moments in Oxford where I could see words coming towards me and I would think, oh, I'm going to stutter. So I, But I had a way because I had figured out by then that I always stammered by the end of it on words that started with a vowel. So I had built up my vocabulary in my early teens. So I would just dodge those words. And I had this thing of I would be talking to you, but I could see certain words coming. Yeah. And it was this very, it was very stressful, but I, I just didn't show it, I guess, you know, um, children are incredible that way. My gosh. Yeah. But it sounds like, you know, obviously, yeah, cause you did move around a lot as a kid and you were in different schools. Oh yeah. We were talking, so many. We were talking beforehand about you being bullied at one uh, boarding school out for in, in shortly. I, I can't uh, think of a, any school. I wasn't bullied until I was 15 because I was always the new kid. And then I had a stammer and then I had this weird food that none of the other kids at the American school had. I was constantly bullied constantly. Yeah. And so, because that's, you know, that's where people, so I, what I find interesting is, A, before all that, you were interested in jokes. So it sort of puts a lie to that idea that comedians become comedians because they're bullied or because they have a tough time. But there is that feeling that if, you know, that 
uh, kids who've been through sort of any any sort of difficult experience are more like to be comedians people who've got authority figure parents that are more like to be comedians I think it's sort of there's some correlation yeah no for sure I mean I think I one of the ways in which I uh came up in the pecking order at different schools uh, along different dimensions was to be the one that made everyone laugh and so I kind of yeah. was under the radar you know uh but I always hung out with the nerds and the geeks because I was kind of like that but uh which I think is interesting because I when I came to England from India I was not perceived in any way as a nerd or a geek right. you know suddenly everyone was like oh you know I was like this tall Indian and Indian woman and uh, you know and and I remember listening to people and thinking who are they talking about because in India neither my height nor my looks was ever anything to be proud of um and I was always you know and I was it was just such a huge mind um can I swear on this show yeah absolutely. it was a mind fuck like okay. no other um but and I don't think I've ever taken on that I've never absorbed it you know I always I was yeah. still on the outside looking in thinking well that's you know again from the other conversations I've heard you having you know your your mum would consider you not to be attractive and no, not, no, ugly. Not straight up ugly straight up ugly. what do you mean not beautiful I once said to her in 2004 we were on the Eurostar I said to her why did you tell me every day I was ugly she said oh because it's what I thought I'm like yeah, but how how is that possible she said I love you and you are a great child but you in my eyes you are a very ugly child you know and I was like could grief but she was so honest about it because she came from the north where fair skin is at a premium and petite girls I'm 510 and dark and then she said plus you know you look like your father and you know some I really don't like him <laughs> god <laughs> but, but it's she, like, you know obviously I mean you a that you were, you were picked out to be a model and then not allowed to be a model but you did model briefly yeah, yeah, yeah. so you clearly were very attractive and are a very attractive woman yeah so but you just don't absorb it you know if no. it's not the voice in your head but now I've learned to sort of I don't know I don't know if I've learned it but I've just sort of I'm still trying to figure I, I'm still trying to have a benchmark of what I'm like right. which is neither this nor that and I just think I think when I'm doing comedy when I'm on stage then I'm just my words and my and the and the hopefully the laughter and that's just to me so freeing yeah um because you've been battered your life has battered you around you've been knocked back stuttering moving around your mum telling you you're ugly I mean it's great <laughs> training to be a comedian but it's not I I feel yeah. I mean because you're so confident and you're so you know that's your persona on stage is so grounded and you know you 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 do belong you know and that's why even in that first gig I saw you absolutely completely belong there you love it and that's a very difficult thing to go so you're so confident so it's so weird to me that you had this you know this very disruptive at least upbringing yeah i did i did i did have a disruptive upbringing the one thing i'll say in my for my parents and i think a lot about this now um that my kids are older my parents were very clear on who they were and they were in a quiet way very self assured so when we were in outside of india etc my father did his prayers in the morning he wore his this ash over here and he went whether it was the world bank or the adb he was very clear who he was and it was a quiet self assurance that comes from knowing who you are and my mother was the same probably not to the same degree but she was very similar she came from a very patriarchal feudal family landowners so there was a lot of rustic wisdom in her that she held on to i think that they that was transmitted to me so even if i'm failing at something or if i'm feeling ugly or if i'm feeling inept somewhere inside there's a few things that i know i am whether that's it's hard to explain it's like there's these things i think no this is not going to change this is key to who I am. I think part of that is language, part of that is culture, part of that is that I'm a Hindu. And I think that's been very important because this whole issue of identity has not really shaken me much. Mm -hmm. And I and I look at my children. My children are Danish, Indian, born in the UK. I mean they're pretty much English. Just, you know, my son is all regularly calls me mate and brav and fam and um and just today we were talking about something and you can see that he that he he feels very English and I I I think about that. I think, you know, my parents had very consistent ways in which they could be themselves. 
whereas I'm quite a mishmash, but I'm hoping that there's a, you know, that they have, that I have somehow unwittingly transmitted something to them that they can hold on to. Because I think that's what's very important is that who am I? There's got to be some place where the, the, there's a floor. Mm-hmm. So you don't fall below that floor, you know? Sure. And it seems from your act, you're quite a harsh mother yourself anyway, that you were... Ah, tough. You're not, harsh you don't suffer, harsh tough and mother. tough are two different things. Though. Yeah, no. Yeah. I'm also harsh, but I'm yeah. more tough than I am harsh. Well, you're doing a podcast with, uh, with uh, uh, Stuart Goldsmith about, called Child, the Child Labour Podcast, which is about where you talk to um, various other comedians about being a parent and the, 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 the difficult sides Yeah, you're going to be on soon and uh, you'll find out. Yeah, I'd love to be on, but, it's, but you, the difference between you and oh Stuart... Oh, my God. Is, Who's a very, you know, woolly, liberal, very nice gent father, I'm sure, but very different to, oh to your, God. your take on that. I know, right? He's, I mean, my question to him is, why do you want your kids to like you? I don't even understand what's that impulse. So I think that's why the podcast, actually, that's where he, you know, he had the idea. And I think the idea was just, I think parenting comes in so many different shapes and sizes, but also the podcast is a lot about how we were parented yeah, and how our guests were parented, because I think parenting whether you want to accept it or not is part of a circle you know um no i'm a very tough parent by western standards all right i mean let's be honest not by my mother's standards but by western standards i am a, i don't have i have i typically don't have a lot of regrets about being tough i probably have some regrets sometimes of being very critical because my parents were very critical with me but i but it was a consistent micro environment you know, you went to school and everyone's parents had been tough on them. Sure. But here you go to school and you're the only person whose mother has said something psychotic about her uterus that morning. It's, uh, it can be a little bit disorienting for the children. Um, so sometimes I, you know, and in, and in those instances, I go back, I've spoken to my kid and said, oh, that wasn't very cool of me or whatever. But because I'm close to my parents, they've seen my parents with me. My parents are, by the way, wonderful to them, but just very tough. So that's the way, that's all, that's, that's that thing is the world over typical that you have a strict parents are when they when you have grandchildren they will spoil the grandchildren I, know, I remember with you. yeah and i said to my mother once i said how come you're so nice to them she said you know why i'm nice to them because first they are so beautiful and fair <laughs> i'm like they're white they're half white and second they are gentle and sweet children and so lovely not like you disgusting i was like okay <laughs> I think you're probably a little bit of a handful. I think you're very you're a spirited and free spirit. I think, aren't you? As a and I can imagine you were as a as a young woman. I'm sure you were. You had your moments, but I think you also you you did obey them. You know, you did. I did. You did I did. Out so much, no, I have so. an elder sister who did all the rebelling. Right. So the job of being the non-rebellious one was on me. I think I was the sibling who probably got away with more because I just learned to not let my parents know. But I was very obedient, and I think I think I was obedient to a fault. Um, my biggest fear was I would disappoint them. I would make them sad because they were already dealing with my sister who was older and very rebellious. And I think I just thought, Ugh, I can't add to that. But then of course, you know, I mean, I say that, but then I left the continent so I could get on with leading my life the way I wanted more or less, you know, and I didn't want to disappoint them. And I still don't, I still, I, I struggle with that sometimes, but I think now it's fine. Like I said, I had the kids and then they were like, fine, fine, fine. Do what you want. And my mother used to say to me, I, sometimes I'm worried that you will divorce your husband. He's such a lovely gem, but you can be quite a bitch. So I was like, okay, this, if, if I do, it's not, I'm not, I'm, I said, you know what, even if it disappoints you, I'm going to do it. Maybe if I have to, and she used to say, yeah, one cannot be perfect. <laughs> she used to feel sad about that. <laughs> Right, let me ask you some emergency questions. I okay. want to ask you, we did, ghosts came up in the pre-interview. I want to ask you if you've ever seen a ghost. I think I have, but it yeah. might just have been that I imagined it. Yeah, well, you definitely imagined it, but go ahead. You know, after my Aya passed away, I yes. she, I used to see her in my balcony all the time. And I was never afraid because she literally used to take it. She started with us when I was three weeks old. And then we had a hiatus when we were away and then we came back to India and she joined. And I would see her drying my clothes on a line. And I was 18, 19. And I thought, that's crazy. I was never scared, but I was like, that's weird. And then one day my mother said to me, she was making South Indian coffee. I remember which you cool like this. And she said, I'm going to ask you something. I don't want you to get freaked out. 
I've been seeing Amma all over the house. Have you? <laughs> and I was like, I have. And she said, I feel like you might be holding something of hers. And I had the nose thing of hers, you know? Yeah. And I was like, no, I haven't. So she said, oh, we have to get the priests in. So they got some priests and they did all these prayers in the house. It's called a havan. It's like a big fire. And and then she, and then, and then Amma, I never saw her again. But when my mother oh. said it, I was like... Oh, but I wasn't that scared. Is weird. That is but a bit then weird. she was obviously happy to be there. Why did you don't have to get rid of her? She was. I didn't really have a choice. Mummy was because in because in Hinduism we want the soul to be free to go to the next world and the next world. You don't want to hold on to them because they've got a journey. They've got to go do their journey, and then we have to come back. You know us. We're like in a loop here. Yeah. So we're always once someone passes away, all your prayers and all your wishes are for them to have a peaceful onward journey. Because they have to go through many, many worlds and they have a lot of karma to deal with. I don't fancy that. I don't fancy going through all those. I hope you're not right because I don't fancy. This one's been enough. Yeah, I get, no, I know. I get, I'd like to stay for a bit longer. I'd like to get to the end of this one. And then? And then uh, what's, what squashed. is that? That's it? Then you're gone go, forever? Go and, oh, here you are in another world. Oh, thanks. You don't want to come back, I Richard? Go, I don't want to come back now. Oh. What am I going to come back as? Am I coming back as like a rabbit or something or like well, it depends back. on your own actions i mean i can't well, I've speak been really bad so i'm gonna come back as something rubbish so i definitely don't want to come back that's not fair and then when i am have a come back as a rat how do i behave well as a rat to be to bump up to the next level no rats never behave well so not I'm to you not to you but in the rat world they have no, their I'd own be a bad rat. I'd be a, a, <laughs> well how do you <laughs> how are you a bad rat what do you do what do you do refuse to eat feces well, I think you'd only know that once you were the rat. I don't think, be there and they go, right, well. I don't think we can say what bad and good rats are doing. They, it's only reactive for us, isn't it? What if I prefer being a rat to being a person and decide to stay as the rat? Well, then I have to be a bit naughty in order to... Keep coming back be, as a rat. I just have to stay exactly sort of ambivalent. I can't be too good or too bad because if I'm bad, I'll come back something worse than a rat. A like slug. A dung or something. Slug. Yeah. If I'm too good, I'll be a... I'll be a Hamster next, probably that's better than being a rat in it. Or a... well, I think rats are more free. Hamsters, some kids gonna have its sticky fingers around you all the time. Ugh. You get all your food laid on little wheel. That's better Do than you being think a rat. Hamsters on the wheel are happy. They're crazy. But anyway, having said that, I don't think the theory of karma works quite one to one like this. Okay. So, but I, I mean, I mean, you're more of an expert on it than me. Well, I, you know, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I mean, I don't even know. I don't even know. I mean, I know I'm coming back. I just try and keep my actions and my intentions in a space where I think oh, I hope it's. Let's see. So, but then, it, then it's on to a higher plane, is it? Next, once you've been a human, if you're good, you go on to being no, not if you're good, a better human. No, not if good is not what counts. I mean, to be outside the cycle of birth and rebirth, you have to be like the Buddha. I mean, for, I mean, for one thing, I can't be sitting here drinking whiskey all the time, can I? So. You're a stand-up comedian. You're screwed. I am. Well, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, that is a, that's a good ghost story, I have to admit. But um, yeah. yeah, okay. I'll ask you. I'll ask you another emergency. Okay, question. ask me. It's going to be. It's going to be random. Oh no, it won't be random. I'll tell you what I'm going to ask you is if you could have because you're a very educated person, so this should be interesting. If you if all the if all the museums and art galleries in the world got together and said. We love you. You can have one item from any of our museums or art galleries. So it could be a painting or a historical uh, art. Kohinoor art. diamond. I like it back, please. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. a good choice. There you go. That's what I'd want. I don't want the I don't want the big hat and all. I just want no. the diamond. And take it and keep it for yourself, or or repatriate it. No, I'd like to keep it. Keep it. <laughs> what, what do you mean? <laughs> or would you keep it and sell? Because it's not much use. You could keep it. You could sell it. And then have all the money, which would be, or would you just like to? No, I would it? keep it first. And then apparently yeah. it's not great luck. So I would keep it first. And then yeah. if you really want to know what I would do with it, I would keep it. I would charge people money to see it for a while. And I would put that money into a fund for girls' education in rural India. I'm not even joking. That's something I've always, I've always thought if I ever make a, you know, if comedy ever gets me to a place where, I mean, I already do a little bit, but I really want to do that because I think educating girls is literally amazing my mother would not have been a therapist you know and would not have been the mother she was to me if her mother hadn't said i really should get my daughters to school rather than get them married off at 13 but quite apart from the noble thing then what i would do is i would send it back to india where we're not great with keeping our artifacts very well we you know we don't we're very busy with taking care of a billion people 
then I would find a way to preserve it and keep it so that, you know, people could see it, but it would at least be back home. Yeah. And in fact, I think it's from Persia originally, so there'd probably be a fight there. But, you know, I don't really want to fight with the Ayatollahs. I think they're quite it's nuts. probably like a dinosaur or something in the past, when it's a piece of carbon yeah. that's been squashed up. So, you know, it, it, ownership becomes very difficult. Yeah, but I would make sure that, that we kept it in, in India, but it was yeah. kept in a way that lots of people could see it because really the Kohinoor thing really pisses me off. Yeah, it does, and it, and also it's in that like crown. It's like, come on, man! Every time my kids go to this, what is it called, the London, the Tower of London, Tower of London it's, it's there, and I'm like, it's not even theirs, and they're like, they always think I'm ranting about that kind of stuff. Well, everything we've got in this country doesn't really belong to us. Well, not everything, but nearly everything. Some things, not not. You know what? I always find this idea that the British Museum is just full of stuff from outside. That's not true. A lot of it, but not all of it. Do you know what I mean? The bo- there's the bloke, the bog body. He was he was English. The, the Pete Marsh there you is go. a bog body. He was English, but you know he's just a bit of PT man, isn't he? That's not worth anything. I'd I'd, I'd give five hundred quid for it. I'd like to have him in my house. That's one of the things I like in the British Museum. <laughs> I, I love the British Museum. It's nice to see all that stuff, but it's. I, you know, I can understand why people are in the yeah, And more I mean, so, the, ta- the Tower of London, they make you go, if, you, if you've been, they make you go past the London. So when you get to the really good stuff, the literal crown jewels, mm-hmm. you're, on a little, you're on a little conveyor belt, so you can't even stop and look at it. It's going, so to make sure I've everyone I've never been moving. because I'm so upset about the thing. You're upset about it, I've, yeah. I've never gone. I mean, I know I've, like you say, oh, you're very educated. I could have come up with something, but it's the first thing. Yeah, if no, it's, it's the good. museums it's, in the UK, I was like, good. just can we have the diamond back? I mean, if you sold it, you could probably educate every female child in the world for about 100 years. I but, think it must the, be worth a lot But the thing is, if you would sell it, who would you sell it to? Some billionaire? And... Back to the queen. No, thank you. I would, I, would, I would never want to get rid of it. So I would, like, get people to see it, and with that money I would fund yeah. these schools. I think it's, bit... it's a good idea. We could try and uh, steal it. Do you fancy doing a heist? It was stolen once by Captain Blood, I think was his name, wasn't it? And also, didn't Mr. Bean try to sell it? Didn't Mr. Bean try to uh, (laughs) take it? I think he did. (laughs) Did he succeed? I I haven't seen the Mr. Bean. uh, It's unclear. I think it was Mr. Bean when he was, uh, he was either trying to stop it. He was trying to stop it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. I think they've got a fake one up there. So you'd steal it and get it back and just find it was a bit of glass. Exactly. No, but if I had the option, I'd take the real one. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's a good choice. And, uh, and, very noble indeed, and I, I hope you get it. I hope society breaks down. You nip in there, nick it, then society comes back up again. That and we can educate those girls. Yeah, um, my wife um, eats soft boiled eggs in a way that I find uh, abhorrent. Um, I just want to. Do you, do you ever eat soft boiled eggs? Do you have a like soft a? Eggs. Yeah. How do you how do you open the soft boiled eggs? Well, this is an important thing because if you if you, how soft boiled, like fully soft oh, no, boiled? So you're dipping soldiers in it. Oh, and okay. So you put well, it in that, well, yeah. Well, the clear thing is you've got to wait after they're boiled. Otherwise, the white stuff comes off with the skin and there's that yeah, membranous gunk, and that's just horrible. Um, so, what I do is I wait a bit and then I crack it with a teaspoon and then I peel off the, 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 the shell and then I take a little bit of the tip off. So, but not all of it, so I can't see the yellow yet. Okay. And then I I'm use a teaspoon. Happy. Not happy, Sindhu. What did you want me to do with it? That's the wrong way to open. That's the way my wife opens. Actually, like sends a love, by the way. It's oh, just, yes. Uh, you, you did a drop them in. Uh, you did a uh, oh, that guilty was so, feminist. I, I got properly. I got properly drunk you on did. that. Oh, you did. I listened to it. It was terrific. And we're um, we're quite surprised that uh, my wife that she was, was married to me. I know. I kept saying it. It was terrible. It's How quite, rude! It's very offensive. But not to her. <laughs> No, to me. I, I know, was listening to I I I mean, how dare Sindhu, as always, speak the truth. But I was um, so you drunk. just knock off the top. You can't start cracking bits of shell and taking and peeling them off. It gets in the egg and it gets in the soldiers. It's in the dish. You've got to lock the top off. You can have not down to the yolk, I agree, have a little bit of white on the top. But just t- get a you want me to cut the, through the shell? Just lop it with a teaspoon and then you're in and then you go bang. And my no. wife is doing what you're doing. Yes. She's teaching my kids to do it that Correct. way. Correct. I can't believe that you agree with this. I well, was going to say, sit who eats and broad, <laughs> sort of broad egg. This was going to save my marriage. I don't know if I can say marriage. Well, I mean, wife. I'm not cutting eggshell to eat my egg. I'm sorry. You're, you're, you're peeling it. But then all the little bits are everywhere. 
No, no, it depends. I mean, listen, this speaks at volumes about your peeling skills. There's bit well when my wife does it, there's bits everywhere. She's taught my kids to do the same. And now I've you know, that's a go it's gonna go into another generation. It's too late. They've been indoctrinated, there's no way back for me. If and anything, I'm, even more I feel how how is she your wife? I just can't. Well I do what I feel I should <laughs> if I wasn't so old, I would just forget about this family and go and start another one. And <laughs> and I would as we before we get married, I'd say, How do you eat your soft boiled eggs? There you go. And then and that's then all I would you need know to know. Because it's it's the worst thing in our marriage. Well, you could do in our otherwise delightful beautiful marriage. marriage. Um, my husband doesn't eat anything but scrambled eggs, so it's just not a discussion. It's just like there's no there's no thing about this okay. at that's all. Probably, that's probably you a see? good way through. Yeah, yeah. yeah just eat, go out, but marry someone who eats eggs in a different way to you. And that there's no then, overlap. I mean, literally, Danish and India, we're, we've been going for so long because there's so little overlap. We just keep saying, okay, fine, because... You know, there's no vested interest in what they're doing, sure. the other one. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. Let me see if there's anything else. Well, let's, well do listen to the uh, Child Labour podcast. That is fantastic. Uh, you, been, you did a Radio 4 show called Sindhu Stan. Oh, that was, yeah, that was a while ago. That was 2018. Yeah. I did that. But I did a radio show. It's not that long ago. You've only been, you've only been really going for about two years. No, so no. Not that long ago. Absolutely. But I just did one now uh, called Things My Mother Never Told Me About Lockdown. Nice. Yeah. And that oh, was a right. fun one. That was a fun one. I it's got Jade Adams, Guz Khan, May Martin, and Tom Allen. It was super Brilliant. fun to do it. It was during lockdown, yeah. Yeah. So we'll look out for that. And you were in May Martin's show, yes. which I haven't seen yet. So so I saw good. a little bit of that sort of, so you're, in it, you're in it all the way through, right? You're, There's a couple of I think towards the end I'm not in the episodes with her parents. I'm not, but I'm part of this kind of group that she goes to a group therapy thing. So I'm in that. So yeah, that was super fun because it's such a great script and May is so great and all the actors were so great. I'm always I I I I can never believe when I've been given an acting role. Because acting is such a different skill. Oh my God. Oh, also, you've done a fair amount of acting, haven't you? So you've been in a film, you've been in uh, yeah. Parts, yeah. I did, yeah. I mean, I've had tiny parts in Sex Education and May's show, um, and uh, and then I did Deborah Francis White's movie, Say My Name. I was a cop, right. Inspector Raj. Um, yeah, but I find acting to be so different because you know you have to learn lines. So many people are depending on you to get it right, and you just keep on doing takes from here, from here, from here, from left, from right, from behind your head, from front of your head. Whereas in stand-up, it's like, I'm on stage. I'm not funny. I can fuck off back home. End of story. Um, yeah, but it's fascinating to me. And I think with acting, I feel like every time I do it, I think, oh, I'd like to do more. And then when a casting call comes along, I think I can never do this. I'm so bad at this. So it's this kind of weird roller coaster all the time. Yeah. Um, it, no. it is, it's, it's, it's odd that one leads to the other. And, you know, yeah, again, to that doing stand-up, suddenly you, know, you become like a, like that, that an acting jobs in the frame, which you know happens to a lot of stand-ups. Well, yeah. May Martin's sitcom does have a lot of uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think, I think in my case, it's less to do with my acting skills and more to do with the fact that I'm in this kind of special place of being funny and Asian, and not that that's why I was in Martin's show, but um, in May's show. But I think a couple of roles, like the like the chemist's wife, I yes. you don't see me. I'm just shouting at Mark, uh, you know. From off stage in Hindi the whole time. Okay, it's great. It was one of my career highlights. I mean, he, yeah. he's such a great, he's such a great comedy actor, and I just loved it uh, the whole time. So yeah, no, I look, man, I, I think anything that allows me to exercise any comedy muscle is a gift. It is. It really is a gift for me. Um, and you, we'll, we're going to wrap up soon because this oh. has gone very quickly. Uh, but. Um... You were in. Were you in Cape Town when the when the virus mm -hmm. struck? So you do lots of gigs around the world, don't you? But how how was that to be that far away when that? Yeah, it, it, it felt a little much. I I I mean, I'd had a very full on year last year with comedy, which I'm very grateful for, but also very full on year personally because my mother had been unwell, and uh, so and then came out of that, and then Christmas, and then went to Cape Town. I've I probably didn't enjoy Cape Town as much as I could have because there was this Corona thing. Yeah. Um, but I did have a great time. There was a number of comics were there. Fern Brady was there. Stu, Stu Goldsmith was there. A number of comics from other parts of the world were there. Finn Taylor. I had a, I had a good time, but certainly not as much as I would have otherwise. And I was on the last flight out because right. the 
everyone else was on the next flight and it got delayed by two days because then just the shit started hitting the fan. And then I came back on the 9th and then I got Corona on the 17th, 18th, just very badly. Really? Right. And, yeah, yeah. And it was like a tough time. I mean, on a scale of one to 10, I probably was an eight where it was like, it was like, should she go to hospital? Should she not? The last four or five days. And that was extremely unpleasant. Right. Okay. Uh, but I don't I think it's connected know. to Cape Town. It's just that I think no. for me, that whole experience is just one block of feeling anxious that then just went into Corona. And I didn't really fully come out of it till the beginning of May. Right. Okay. So it was a very long convalescence. But I think I was also convalescing from having been on tour and done this I mean, I don't know if it's a lot of nights, but I was not expecting this tour to extend and become what it became. Yeah. So all in all, I would say I was quite stressed. And quite, I, I was quite run down, and then I got corona, so it took my body quite some time to pick itself up again. Yeah, well, I think that's the way, especially when you've been touring, it is, you know, I, I, when you stop, you immediately get ill as a community. You do Edinburgh, you stop, you immediately get ill. You do a tour, you stop, you immediately get ill. So if you get hit by something as serious as that, then I can really see. And I know it's it's a weird disease or virus because it's you know affects people so differently. And some people don't have anything and they've got it and don't know they've had it. And some people, you know, I've, I've had a friend who's basically been ill for, you know, three or four months just on, a, on that kind of level, that kind of eight level where he's been into hospital a bit, but not... Oh. Not really, but it's just not, you know, people say, oh, you're over it in 10 days, but he's literally been no. four or five months. You know, no, so I mean, I think I think for me it was uh, last year was the tour and then sex education and May's thing and then the Tez O'Clock show and then the second Apollo, which was beautiful. To, beautiful that I got it. I think I didn't do great, but thank God they edited it so well. Um, I think hosting it is very scary because you come on cold. Yeah. And I hosted the first show, so that was, I was very... And then my last tour date was, and throughout my mother had been very sick. Then the last tour date was end of November. And then on the 18th of November, my mother had a second stroke on the 20th. She passed away, which I was not expecting because she wasn't that sick. You know, she was getting better and she was talking. And I mean, she was, we were fine. She was like totally normal. And then she just happened to have this second stroke. So the 20th of November, she passed away. I was supposed to be in a play in December, but I, from then on, I don't really know what was going on. I flew to India. I took, you know, I, I handled all the the logistics. I, my father was there. I brought him back home. Then I, then we had Christmas. I said no to the play. I just really wasn't. I I said yes to the play. Everyone around me was like no. Uh, and then January came, and I think it just occurred to me that my mother was gone, which you know, my mother is a huge influence, a huge part of my life, and it was very unexpected. Um, and then February, I, I also changed agents <laughs> in November, the week before mommy passed away. And then, and then by February, my, I was starting to really feel run down. And then I went after Cape Town and then I got Corona. So really, I, I'm not surprised Corona came. My immune system was made of tears and Kit Kat. Yes. That's absolutely. kind of how I was surviving. Yeah. You know, so that's you know you were having a bad year even before this year. So well, I mean, but I was having a great year comedy wise, and I think that's yeah. one of the great mysteries to me is you know you can be having a year that's so insane personally, but comedy was just out of control. Yeah, I mean it's it has been. I mean, given that you like you know I know you were starting twenty twelve, but you probably twenty fifteen is more like the proper start date. Twenty so seventh of Jan twenty fifteen. Okay, I had a gig, bad. and I remember so, at the end of that gig after what Peter said to me. He said, you have to find a number more than one per week that you're going to gig. Right. Because you're not going to make it otherwise. You can't just show up and kill and then leave and then not show up for three months. Yeah. You, yeah. And I made, a, I made a note from the next day I started to get in touch with, and I said, I'm going to gig twice a week. And then I made it four and then I made it five. And then I just committed to that. And I changed my whole life to suit that. I have three kids. Yeah. And those are late nights. Yeah. And then I was going out of town and, you know, so, yeah. And, that's and then out of the country and, yeah. yeah. All the world. So it's, uh, but it's, it's, it's astonishing when you see someone, you know, some people, especially now, it's very hard, I think, to, to, to do that sort of fast track. That, you know, when I, in the 90s, it was possible to do a five-year plan and you'd get on, you might be on TV at the end of five years. But for you to be in five years and to have got to the level you've got to is, uh, is astonishing. So do you have, like, 
you don't really do you're not really planning where do you want to go to America? Do you want to do I, more acting? Do you want to do more stand up? What's what's the plan when we're back on the road? Uh I'm I I I I think my medium term plan is to this this second show I'm writing. My stand up is my first love. Um and if you're from Netflix and watching this that doesn't mean I don't want to act. So please don't think that. I have a second show and I'm writing it and I mean I it's sort of work in progress and I'd like to take it on tour which was on the cards but it's probably got delayed. That's kind of what I want to do, you know. I I there's there's a I have intense gratification from that uh medium of going and doing the show and having an audience and taking these things and talking about them and making people laugh and getting the show, you know, better and better. That's that's the that's the concrete thing I have. Yeah, yeah. Everything else, if it comes great, if it doesn't, it'll come eventually if it's supposed to. Sure. I think what's interesting, I think you've always had the soul of a stand-up comedian even before you knew what stand-up yeah. comedy really yeah, was. Yeah, 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 yeah. 100%. Always, you've sort of always, I think that's why you've slipped into it so, you know, seamlessly, really. I think that's to, to, it's really interesting for me, having seen you at what was a, a, in, an early gig and just think this is a very, very assured performer and then to find out that you'd done so little actual performance. Um, I, I, that's the only way I can make sense of it that you've been doing jokes your whole life. <laughs> I think so. Through different, <laughs> different, and I've been dying all my whole life with my stammer and my stutter, and it's yeah. not stopped me. I wake up the yeah. next day and say, Let's have another go. Yeah. So that's that's the soul of a comedian. So, yeah, I think there's plenty of time, Cindy. I think oh, it's going to be okay. You, Richard. I'm, I I'm so happy you know, to I hear think, you say that. I think it's going to be all right and i think you're going to go from strength to strength i'd really like to thank you so much for doing this it's been really uh interesting talking to you it's been and wonderful uh, to talk to you ladies and gentlemen it's sindhu v thank, thank you very you much so we're Bye. back next week with maria konikova at 3 p.m because she's in america so uh she's a psychologist and therapist and poker player it's going to be good you're going to enjoy it bye-bye everyone see you next week thanks a lot bye thank you How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>